doll a ride? They all should be needed. If not, Seeing much right now. Am I clear? Hello, Mrs. Vaughn. Am I clear? Go. <laughs> Landis, you can't hear. Invited here to speak to everyone. A little bit loud. I was invited here to speak to everyone based on a vocational program that I came to here a few months ago and spoke to the guys that came through uh, the vocational program. So, what I want to share with everybody today is uh, starting off the series, taking it to another level, and just Give everybody an idea of where I came from, um, the struggles that I had to overcome, and where I'm at now, and where I intend to go in the future. I called in and asked, "What, you know, what should I wear?" Because you know, in my job and in my profession now, I, we wear a uniform or we wear uh, pants and a shirt and a tie every day to work. For one of the worst shirts plus uh, black pants and dress shoes every day. <clears throat> but that's me at work. And this is, you know, me at home and when I'm off of work. So uh, I wanted I wanted y'all to see me in my everyday, not in how I am at work. We'll talk about that, you know. But that's it's two different worlds, you know, and that's part of what I want to, you know, tell y'all about. The fact that you can maintain your identity and your culture and still uh, work in a professional environment because that's work and when you have to work, that's you. So first, let me oh. just okay. tell you how I'm going to myself. I'm going to over here. I'm going to let you drag. It hasn't been that long. Oh, God. Where did the mouse go? Oh, oh here it is. Well, man, that was 20 years ago. 30 years ago. That was 30 now. Oh, I was in that same type of life. He's the one that works. He's the one that works. Go through these type of classes, type of course, 
I was one of the first ones during that time at the height of the crack epidemic when I was 9, 10, 11 years old. I was one of the first ones every day on the news. It's not like it is now. Every day on the news, all they talked about was the drug arrests, the conditions inside of the projects. Only thing that you saw on TV was um, guys like me that was getting arrested. That was the everyday news at that time. Now, I was the first, one of the first ones during that time that when they did these news report stories, uh, they showed us on the news. You have nine, 10, 11 year old kids selling crack, carrying a gun, don't go to school, do whatever they want to do. That was my generation at that age. And I was one of the, uh, one of them ones that uh, my mother was a crackhead. So I'm gonna talk to y'all just straight up and down because that's the type of dude that I am. So I'm not gonna you know, talk around in a circle like I'm talking to a six or seven year, year old, okay? So my mother was a crackhead. My father was a dope fiend and he was locked up at the time of me growing up. So most of my younger years, he was in and out the joint. And my mother was all over the place, a full-fledged crackhead. So I had the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do at 9, 10, 11 years old. And these are the things that that I did. Uh, so they showed us on the news, 9, 10, 11 years old, selling crack. My family decided that it might be best if they send me to the south, Winston Salem. So I always was a city kid. You know, by the time I came to the south for the first time, I already could take the bus, take the train, go wherever I wanted to go. I'm in Manhattan, I'm 12, 11, do whatever I want to do. Um, so when I, they sent me down to the Winston Salem for the first time, uh, it was a big shock to me. And uh, I decided I'm going to stay, try to give it a shot. I'm going to go to school, try to you know, give it a shot. And I did. I stayed down here for about eight months. I said, you know what, I'm going back to the city, went back. Once I got back to New York, I came, I uh, talked to some dudes. And they said, man, you should go back, go back. Take you some stuff with you, make you some money. 
So that's what I did. At 13 years old, I jumped on the bus, Greyhound, with a you know, pocket, pocket full of drugs and a pocket full of tapes. It was tapes, then see, well, we wasn't even in, have CDs yet. We still had yeah. tapes on it back then. <laughs> so I jumped on the bus, came back down to North Carolina, and got it going from there. I did go to school. One of the differences between me and a lot of people that I was in school with that was came, came from the same type of lifestyle that I did. I always was like a little bit harder than you know some of the guys that I ran with because from a young age I just loved to read, so I read a lot. And from my reading, I had a different perspective on on uh, on life and on things. So far as my schoolwork in school, I, I, I didn't want to do the work, but when it came time to take the test, I could pass the test because I could read and comprehend and understand. Um, but in the midst of that, at that age, I still was dabbling, dabbling in the streets, trying to go to school, and in and out of trouble because I had an attitude that I just was going to do whatever I wanted to do. And did. Uh, I never made it through here at all. But my brother did. My younger brother, he's two years younger than I am. And he's finishing up an eight, nine year sentence in the state now. But uh, he came through here. The same place, it's been here forever. He, he came through here. He went to Polk, he went to all of those places, and he's just a career. Offender inside and out, starting from here. At 10 or 11, 12 years old, 13, however old he was when he came through, came through here 20 some years ago. I never made it through, I never came through here, but I did go through the court system as a juvenile. Uh, the only thing that saved me from coming through here at that, at that time was I was selling drugs and making a little bit of money on the street that I could afford to pay for my own lawyer. 14, I think I was when I caught my first uh, my first case. That I mean, I would have, if it hadn't been for that, I would have probably did about two years based on the charges that I had at that time. Uh, what I did, I went to school, I played football, I played basketball, I tried to, you know, to, to hang in there. But by the time I was 15, no more school for me. That was it. I was already full-fledged in the streets. I already had a car before I even had my driver's license. It was a different time than, than it is now. And at 15, I was selling drugs in school and to the superintendent and the school system says you just can't come to school no more, period. You kicked out of school, you can go to alternative school, you can, you're not coming back here. Because, I mean, I, it was so bad at one point with me in school selling drugs that I had crackheads coming to the school in a cab to meet me at lunchtime. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was that bad. I, had, I carried a gun to school when I was 15, but it wasn't under no threat. I mean, what? But I, I took a gun to school at, at 15 until they finally had enough on me and kicked me out of there. That same year, my uh, girlfriend at that time became pregnant. So I'm in the ninth, 10th grade selling drugs in and out of trouble, in and out of courts, and got a girl pregnant. She's 16. Once I left school, they gave me some options. You can go to alternative school. You can go and get your GED. I did. I was 16, 17 when I went. Uh, my, my first daughter's already born by now. Just to give you an idea how long that's been, she'll be 23 next year. But uh, 
my first daughter was born at that time. I did go to the community college and got my GED. My advantage, though, what made me even think enough to get my GED, to know how important school was, is that uh, I read a lot. And my reading comprehension was good, which means the stuff that I read, I understood what I was reading enough to be able to explain it back to somebody. So I had an idea of how important school was. I did go back. I got my GED at the community college. Now, mind you, during this time, uh, I'm still hustling in, in the streets. And uh, every city and every community, every neighborhood, Back in those times, you're going to have probably one or two real young guys, 15, 16, 17 years old, that just knew how to make money and made money. And um, I was one of them. I did it. And the summer of 1996, when I was 17 years old, I had my GED. And I had always the older dudes, you know, some of the older dudes who did go through school and went through college used to come back and tell us, excuse me, what the college life was like. And it sounded like a, it was a party, you know, it sounded like this is somewhere you want to go. It's fun, it's this, it's girls, it's so um, I sent out some applications. I mean, mind you now, I'm in the streets every day, hard. Oh, Baby and everything. I sent out some applications just, you know, see who would respond. Several schools responded back. And I selected one of them. I sent in my application to Shore University. They responded back. They accepted me. At that time, I had a, a Cadillac and a 95. Ford Pro GT. I packed up the caddy and shot down the road. My first day of school, I went to school on my first day of school. This is my, you know, how crazy I was now. I'm out of control. On my first day of school, I went to school with $20,000 in cash just to spend and a quarter pound of weed just to smoke. I packed up the Cadillac and hit the highway and went to ride. This was on my first day. On my first day, I'm in the stairwell smoking the blunt with my, with my roommate, and, and we running from the, the, the campus security on my first day in uh, college. But I hung in there. I made it through. Uh, still deep in the streets, and steady babies on the way coming. Steady coming. Now I'm on my second one at that time. <clears throat> Still deep in the streets, catching cases left and right. In college, two kids. Just to give you an idea of the type of things that I was into, and all of this is just to give you an idea of where I came from, so you will know that the possibilities at the end when we get to the end. Just to give you an idea of the type, type of cases that I was catching. I saw with a deadly weapon, shooting into an occupied dwelling, possession with intent to sell, saw with a deadly weapon on a government official inflicting serious injury, which means I ran over a police officer in my car and kept it going. shooting charges, robbery charges. My arrest record right now got 32 felonies on there. Not conviction, but just my arrest. 32 dismissed felonies that I've had. By the time I was 21, I spent $230,000 on lawyer alone catching these cases back to back before I even got 21 years old. My mother and father, remember, I'm still, my mother and father does crackhead. 
and my father that was in and out of the joint finally out. He got himself together. Just when he think he, you know, ready to get his life together. HIV positive, full blown AIDS, and then my mother, they no longer with us. This is the, the truth. This is some of the obstacles that, you know, we up against. They are gone from their drug abuse and drug addiction lifestyle. My mother was 48 when she died, my father was 52. That is young. It seems it's old from where you sit there now, but that is, that is younger still. which left me by myself, which I had a grandmother. She did the best that she could do to help us, to you know, help take care of us. So I ended up getting kicked out of college. We on campus, me and my crew, taking pictures with guns out. The staff got the pictures, kicked me out of school. Then didn't file no charges, but kicked me out of school. So now I'm out of college and I'm still deep in the streets. 19, 20 years old. Child number three. By the time I got 21, five children. Still haven't never worked a day in my life. Still don't really know how to do nothing but us. That's all I know how to do, and that's all I ever do, and all I aspire to do at that time. I mean, I could probably come up with a thousand and one excuses and reasons why I felt like I had to do this, why I felt like I had to do that, and I had to survive. I mean, I have uh, so many excuses for that, as we, we do, when you, you know, you're doing something that you really don't supposed to do. And yes, I can blame the system, I can blame the environment, I can blame this person and that person, but at the end of the day, we have an individual choice that we can make regardless of our circumstances and situation. Later on in life, I proved that to be true. But at that time, I didn't know none of these things. So fast forward just a little bit until uh, 24 years old and have been under federal investigation since I was 17. Never caught a federal case. They went in and they went out, my whole crew. In and out. The defense came through for the last time and grabbed everybody. Some of them are still there. And this was in 2099, 98. Some of them still there. So. <clears throat> What happened with me when the feds finally did come through and got enough of a case to put together? Once they indicted me and I so got my lawyer, I'm thinking now because you don't know, you're thinking, oh, man, I'm just probably going to cost me, you know, 30, 40,000. I'm, you know, just like the rest of the cases is going to know. You can buy the feds. It's, you don't, it's not enough money that you can buy the feds. You're going to jail. Once they can you get that indictment, you're going to jail. I don't care how much money you got. So once they um, grabbed me, went to court, I think I'm invincible. I'm going to trial. I'm going to trial. I'm going to beat this case. I'm going to trial. Went all the way through the first trial. With the feds, two lawyers. I've hired two lawyers. I'm in the suit. You know. Get all the way through the end of the trial. Hung jury, which means that either one person said that not guilty, or 12 people said not guilty, and one person said guilty. However, it's not a unanimous decision like it has to be. The judge asked the U.S. Attorney's Office, the DEA, the FBI, the ATF, what would y'all like to do? We can dismiss these cases or we can retry it again. The United States Attorney, because when you catch a federal case, it says United States of America versus you. This is the whole weight of the United States government just against you. He hopped up and said, we're going to try it again. <laughs> yeah. 
violence and it's a threat to the community. They don't want him there. He is considered to be armed and dangerous at all times, and we want him off of the street. They tried the case again, and this time they won. When it came time for sentencing, the judge, the United States federal judge that sit back there and way up high, he said, Mr. Robinson, <clears throat> I have a file here that dates back to 1995. You were under investigation from the FBI, the DA, and the ATF. The Middle District of North Carolina, the Southern District of New York, and the Middle District of Georgia have been under investigation for many years. Have you been able to slide and skate around the system? I do not know, but today you are going to prison. I have sat up all night trying to find a way to give you more time, but the law will not allow me to give if you the sentence that I want to give. So you are getting the maximum of sentence allowed under law. I'm 24 years old at that time. And he said to me, oh, when you get out, you'll be a young man still. You'll be in your mid-30s. Hopefully you get your life together and make a, and, and make a contribution to society. But from my experience, because I've been a judge for 30 years, you'll get out and you'll be back. You'll be standing right before me again, and I'll give you another 10, 15, or 20 years. Have a nice life, Mr. Robinson. So at 24, I never been in jail before or prison. When I caught a case and went to jail, I bailed right out immediately. So now I'm getting my chance to stay the night. I am not coming out. Once you go through that door, that's it. You're not coming back out. And uh, for as much as I had been through up to that time, I thought that I was a lot older than I actually was until I got to my place. When you, at that time, this was in 2000. And Three two thousand and four. The prison system was so out overcrowded in the feds. When we went through, when I went through transit for my first time to get from, um, got to go to a Atlanta penitentiary, federal penitentiary transit. When I got there, a two man cell, however big it is, just a two man cell. You got two, one on the floor here, one on the floor there, one on the floor there. Five of us in a two-man room. This is how many people were in and out of the feds. This is how overcrowded it was at the time. Grown men, sick men, crazy men. Some people that got five years, some people that got 50, some that got three life sentences. You just piled up in the room. After three months of that, five men in the two-man cell, after three months waiting in transit to get to your location because your location is waiting for a bed. Like there's so many people that's coming in that there's literally not enough beds in the joint that you're going to. You got to wait for somebody going to go home or somebody going to get transferred. When you get to your spot, got to go straight to the hall until the bed come available. <laughs> That's how bad it was during those times. And then, now, <clears throat> this is where it kind of get a little interesting and it can re and relate to what you guys is going through now. Once I got in the joint, I didn't bring a lot of pictures, but I brought just a few because sometimes when you like you, you, you're talking, you're trying to vision it, but it's kind of hard to vision 
me going through these kind of things the way that you're looking at me now. You can't see me like like I was, but it is so. This one here, this is me. This is my crow. See it? Right. And this is me. I probably at this time been in not even a year. So you were locked up with a background? Yeah, they have a little background for the pictures. You're going to be there pretty much for the rest of your life. So they're going to try to make it comfortable as possible for you. But you can see there. Yeah. And I think that was probably 2003. And just to just to give you an idea how serious it was and that it still is this is my main main Cadillac right here we used to get money to grab on the streets he's from Detroit he's been there since 1998 he have a life sentence his paperwork say his release date is deceased So at this time, life sentence. Had it not been for Obama, who which gave him a pardon, he would be spending the rest of his life. But Obama cut his sentence down to 30 years. So he got about, uh, he has about five or six years left. He's been in since 1998. This picture right here. That's me and my main man, Pops. Once you get a certain age in the joint, you become Pops. This is Pops. At this time right here, Pops had been in for 27 years at this time. They sent old pops down to Butner. This is with Butner's where you go to go to the graveyard. So they sent old pops down to Butner. And he he died on the inside. Pops. Never killed nobody, never did no violent crimes. I think he got caught with about $100 worth of crack. Pretty much a life sentence in federal prison. Died. One more. This one right here, this is my daughter. This is how small she was when, when I went out. She'll be 23 and she has the baby now. She's going to ask how long now. Now, In life, my life and in yours, you're going to come to a turning point in your life. It's going to be good or bad. You will be the one who get a chance to make that decision. For me, the turning point in my life is once I got to join. I could have just, you know, played basketball and worked out and, you know, played cards and gambled and, you know, that high and you know just all these things is available to do if you don't want to do nothing productive with your time that is all right you're going to be assigned a job you're going to do the job or you're going to go in the home one or the other and with the rest of your time you can go out and play you can do whatever you want you can go to the library the law library you can take classes you can take courses but they're not going to force you to do none of that stuff I made the decision while I was there that I'm going to take this time and I'm going to just want to do something productive with it. I'm going to read. I'm going to take these classes. I'm going to stay out of the, the way. And uh, I did. And it wasn't hard because you have these dudes. They over there. They do that. I don't, I don't mess with that. You know. You have the religious sects that you know. That's what they do. I have my religious background, I stuck to that. You have the gangs. This gang 
drugs, the crib, the vice lords, the Mexican mafia, so many different gangs. Gangs. Then you have your own culture, your own city, your own state that you're from. You can run with them dudes, or you could be the be one of the ones that want to make some changes in your life and have an opportunity to change your life when you get out. Even though at that time you don't really see a, a way because you don't know how to do nothing and you don't know nothing different. But I got around guys who was businessmen, they got addicted to some drugs, might have committed a crime, now they're here. I got around like um, stockbrokers and like older guys that have been there 15, 20 years and they had something positive to tell me, I listened. I did a lot of uh, reading and a lot of uh, writing and was trying to prepare myself for just a chance to do something different. Because I promised myself, I said, man, after all of these years that you're going to spend in the joint, when you get out, at least give yourself a few years to get yourself back together. So I tried that. And that is where we lay because you're here now, you have an opportunity to do some work your time. If you do not take advantage of this opportunity, The outcome is a little bit bleak. It is going to be a little bit tough to get back. Simple as that. If you don't start preparing for it now. That's what I did. I started preparing for it because my, I was getting out. I had a release date. I started preparing for it. I took my time away and I took the fact that I had a sober mind, right? Because when you hear, and believe it or not, two days ago, I was talking to the mayor of Charlotte to tell her that I was coming in. And uh, the country, the government is like looking for a way like to reach people your age. They don't like really know what to do because things are kind of out of control. So now they open to hear any ideas from me. Street, street dude, with a record, heavy record. So, but they like, they want to hear whatever type of ideas that we have because they're having a hard time trying to reach the, the youth. And I was telling her that um, the government and the community have to take advantage of this opportunity to reach the youth when you're in a, a situation like this school, a detention facility where you. Nothing you can do but say, come on in here and sit down. You got to sit down and you can go back to your, to your room. That way we have your attention and went and with a sober mind. Because we have tried to get to y'all on the street when you're out, before you get here. A lot of attempts have been tried, each each and every one of y'all in this room and everybody else that supports that camera. Cannot tell me that nobody didn't ever, I didn't ever have nobody, nobody. Along the way, there have been people who try to guide you in the right direction before you got here. Here you are. But you have another opportunity to, to, to get that straight. So, I'm out now. I did my time. I went in at 24. I am back, but I'm 33. Never had a job before. On federal paper. Can't smoke, can't drink. And I used to like to smoke. Can't smoke, can't drink. Three years worth of paper. Got to work. The government said you have to have a job or else you're going to Six months and a half way house. In Charlotte. <clears throat> now, when I went out for the first time to look for a job with my record, number one, bad enough, you don't know how to do nothing. 
Number two, you are black. But number three, you got a record. Uh, I'm serious. And you have been to prison. You got all of these strikes against you before you even get in the car to go look for the job. So you've been locked up for nine years, right? Nine years. In the fair. <clears throat> so I'm out, and it's time to look for a job. I'm still like a little excited. I'm happy to be out. <laughs> and you know, the world is mine. I'm going out here, I'm going to get it. I ain't going back to the streets. I'm just going to work. My mind is made up. I'm going to work. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to get to the job. I'm going to tell the man how I'm going to work hard. I feel about 103 applications within a three months span. I took so many different classes. I went to the Goodwill, I went to Urban, I went to Charlotte Works, I went to Crisis Center, I went to all of these different type of programs, took these classes, was going to be a forklift driver, was going to be a construction worker, man, I was going to be, I'm going to drive a tractor trailer. And I'm thinking, I'm going to do all of these things, I'm willing to do anything, because I want a job so bad that everybody has told me no. Oh, just fill out the application online. They will get back with you. They say, well, can I talk to somebody around here? You know, you're in a suit, you're in a tie, and a shirt, you think you're going to look presentable. No. When I got my final, because they got so tired of seeing me at the Goodwill Center, Resource Center, finally, they said, all right, Mr. Robinson. We're going to give you a shot. We're going to put you in one of our stores. You're going to be the guy who gets the stuff out of the people's car and put it in the bins. You're going to move these bins around. And then you're going to stop these shelves. And you're going to get paid seven twenty-five an hour. And out of that seven twenty-five an hour, you owe the government back 25% of that for allowing you to stay in the halfway house. Now, mind you, I never worked. And I always had street money. So for me to work for 40 hours, to get paid every two weeks, and my check is 500 and some dollars, and I have five kids who have only heard that, oh, man, you got to get all you're going to get out, you're going to get this money, y'all going to be all right now. And this what my kids is here as they they growing up, and this is what they expect now that I'm home. That I'm just going to get it back popping and everybody's going to be uh, living good. And here I am, you know, getting people's garbage out of their cars at the, the Goodwill. That I begged for that job and was so happy that I got it. I took a picture and put it on Facebook. Oh, I got my first job. 33 years old, you know. But I was proud that uh, I hung in there at least for that amount of time. I had a job. I'm going there. I'm trying to like keep a positive attitude while I'm there. But it is tough. And along the way, oh, they calling. I'm home now. So my man's in there. They're like, yo, all right, baby, look, this is what we got going on. This is what we're doing. Me, though, he could barely speak English. He speak a very little bit of English. But he say, all right, my friend, you go back. I got him something for you. So I'm at Goodwill working. I told, you know, that's where I'm at. I'm at the Goodwill working. Still in the halfway house. Because of the things that I did before I went in, I still at least had a car. That was an advantage. I had a car and I could get my driver's license. So I did at least have a car. I'm at work one day. I'm just working. You know, I had told him. Me go. A few weeks ago, I ain't think nothing about it. I'm talking to a lot of people at home. I'm there working. Here you come. The club. I'm in the halfway house still. Up to the halfway house in the truck. You know, they drive the truck. They do the trucks. Pull up in the truck. I didn't talk to you. Come out to the truck. He got two keys of cocaine to 
This is for you. I bought this for you. Just pay me back when you get back on your feet. When you get back right, that's okay. Just pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you shaking your head. No, but I said yes, and I took it. I took it. I said, oh, man, it's on. I be talking about a ride from that Goodwill back, uh, that ride from that Goodwill to my sister's house. You talking about scared to death, riding in that car still in the halfway house with two bricks of cocaine, just did nine years in the joint, couldn't resist the temptation, here I am, it's right there. You thinking, man, if I get pulled over, I can't stop and I don't want to chase. So I'm, like, yep, yep. I'm not stopping. I ain't going back to jail. <laughs> I couldn't even sleep that night. Tossing and turning, trying to think, like, who can I trust? Like, I got first cousins, I got brothers. I'm thinking, like, who can I trust? I can't even trust nobody. I'm laying there that night, tossing and turning. Cocaine. The next day, got up, called me, go, y'all, I can't do it, come get it. So you know, like, this is this wholesale, this is over $50,000. But you, you can call somebody and they will give you 50000 so fast for this. And you can go and do whatever you think that you want to do. But I did, I gave it back. It was hard. Because I didn't have none. So Nico, he respect that. He took it back. And back to work for me. Now, I did write down a few topics. So now that I gave y'all, I gave y'all an idea of where I came from, how I got the way I was at. The next important thing from me being there at work. And hanging on because it was hard. My kids is calling. I, you know, I'm going to be out of the halfway house. I got to support myself. There's no assistance. Like, no, you got a record. You ain't getting no Medicaid. You ain't getting no food stamps. And stuff. That's that. You ain't getting that. I tried. Stood in the line at the social service, trying to get food stamps, trying to get a voucher to get some clothes, trying to get a voucher to get. Gas. I did. I stood in the line. It was, it was humiliating because you know, like, here I am, street dude. I'm in the line. This lady looks like she's probably 70. This lady got like four bad kids with her. She looks like she's about 22. And we all in the same line need assistance. They took a bus, like all them kids on the bus. At least I did have a car. When I'm standing in line with these kind of people. So the next topic, and this will determine where you're going to be at in life from today, is attitude. I knew that I was going to have to humble myself. I'm not who I was before I went in. The world is different now. Like back then, on my phone, you had to put, you know, flip on. Now it's the, this kind of phone. It's been almost 10 years. The world has changed. So, my attitude, I had to find a way to keep a positive attitude in spite of everything that was up against me and everything that I faced on a daily basis. Not just yesterday, but yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And that brings me to my favorite quote. Like I said, I did read a lot. And out of all of my, the things that I have read, this is my favorite quote. And this is how I built off of this quote in order to, to stay uh, positive when everybody was telling me, you know, that my future looked at bleak. And it you know, seemed like I wasn't going to be no more than an eight, nine, ten dollar an hour guy. Or back to the streets, which was just back to the joint or the grave. Which now, 
from when the time I was a young age, we had like a better chance of at least surviving than you got now. Because now you're gonna you have a better chance of getting killed before you even get to the joint. Now, different. But this is my quote. And I'll read it on now. Does nothing can take the place of persistence. I'm gonna stop along the way and I'll read it again. Not to assume that you don't know what it is, but don't worry, because I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> persistence. That means continuing to go on and continuing to push forward no matter what. No matter how many times somebody tells you no, no matter how high it look, you continue to push forward. Persistence. Nothing can take the place of persistence. Education will not. The world is full of educated fools. Trust me. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. A lot of people have talent. They never use it. They, you know, they, they choose to do something else with their talent. That is it. Genius will not. There's no accolade that you can achieve higher than genius. Once you are genius at something, you can't go no higher than that. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. It's like it's so many geniuses out here that don't get rewarded for it that it's just like it's almost just like a saying. It's just like something that you said. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent, all powerful. Can't get no higher than omnipotent. That is a word they use to describe God. So you can't get no higher than that. The same, press on, has solved and always will solve all the problems of mankind. And this is a quote by the 30th president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge. So now let me just read back to it straight through. Nothing can take the place of persistence. Education will not. The world is full of educated fools. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than not successful people with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a problem. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The same press on has solved and always will solve all the problems of mankind. Calvin Coolidge, started the president of the United States. That quote is what encouraged me to keep pushing, to keep persistent in spite of everything. And it was a lie. So even though I had my little job at Goodwill and was proud of it, I knew that that wasn't going to be it. It can't be. I cannot make it like that. I cannot survive like that. And all the triggers coming to your mind, oh, man, I'm just going to shake a little bit. You know, I'm going to keep my job, but I'm just going to do a little something where I can, all this kind of stuff come in your mind. But I believed in myself enough to say, man, I can get money and I don't have to do that. But how am I going to do that? I took all these classes, all these courses. Nobody still, once I complete the courses, they won't give me a job. I still didn't give up. Persisted on. At some point, I had got told so told no so many times that uh, instead of just giving up and laying down, I said, "Man, I'm gonna stop like walking into Walmart, walking into the factories, and walking into you know um, food places. These is all furniture places. These are all places that said no." I said, "Man, I'm going in the biggest hundred floors." You know, I'm going into the nicest car dealership. I'm going into all of the nicest buildings. I'm going to start trying to ask them for a job. Like, I'm going to stop believing because I almost convinced myself nobody's going to give you a real job because you have a right. Nobody's going to never give you nothing because you are black. You might as well forget it. I stopped believing that and said, man, I'm just going in there and see. They're going to have to tell me no. I done been told no over 100 times already. They're just going to have to tell me no again. And at some point during that, 
I walked into a car dealership. I only knew a little bit about cars because I had bought so many when I was in the street. Never had sold nothing but narcotics. But I walked in there, asked for an application. They had one. Like a lot of these places saying, oh, sir, here's the website. You got to go online and fill out this application. They had one. I filled it out right then and there on the spot. And one of the managers came out to talk to me. And uh, I told him, because I was now at the point, I'm getting straight to the point now. This is this, we ain't gonna waste too much time. This is the situation, this is. <laughs> the manager said, uh, man, with a record like that, we can't hire you. You're not gonna pass the back. But wait a minute, let me go and talk to my boss, who is the owner, and see if I can get something worked out for you. Yeah. Uh, so he did. Now, when I had my opportunity to talk to him, I mean, I let him have it. This is what I'm trying to do. This is what I've been through. Look, I just need a shot. I just need one opportunity. If you give me this opportunity, I won't let you down. I mean, I'm pitching. I'm selling because this is like the first time I'm, I'm like on the internet, like I'm talking to a person. Everywhere else, you just give them the paper. They'll call you, but they never did. I'm now talking to a person. And I pitched. And he said, all right. I am putting my career, I have a family, I have children, I have grandchildren. So I am putting my career on the line for you. Because if you do something crazy up in here, it is going to come back to me. Because I have the, he said, my boss told me it's your call. So he said, I'm making the call for you right now. I'm going to give you a shot. I have at that time been out for one year. Let me just stop and answer some questions real quick. Finish. Okay. I'm wrapping up. I at that time had been out for one year. I passed the drug test. They waved the background. I am in. Oh, it's game time now. Yeah, they don't let me in. I'm in. First day, reading everything I can read, taking all of the tests. I am so still. And I see a lot of these people that work in here are fake. And I'm about to get this money because they fake. And they don't have an idea how blessed they are just to be in here. Because I was, went through over 100 places just to get here. Now I'm here and I'm not doing no fake from the first day. <clears throat> Learning everything that I can learn, talking to the people who've been working there for years and been in the business for years. I'm serious. I'm inquisitive. I want to know. And within six months, this is no lie, within six months, I was the top salesperson there. I was at a Mazda store then on uh, South Boulevard, Charlotte. Became the top salesperson within six months. And that brings us to our time, which is taking it to another level. I could have just easily Took the two bricks, went on, jumped back in the street easy. I had them in my hand. I could have just kept on working at Goodwill and just hoping that one day I might become assistant manager or something. But I knew that I had to take it to another level and continue to do that. Top salesperson. Well, in a year from, from grinding now, because in my mind, when I was at work, when I got there and got out of that car, in my mind, I'm on the block with dimes. Like that's how I'm like thinking. Like I'm I'm out I'm out here hustling, baby. I'm gonna do whatever I gotta do. Every customer is my customer. Every sale is my sale, and all of these cars is mine. And I'm about to push them. And I got it for you, baby, for the love. <laughs> my pitch. I got it. Come on in and have a seat. In one year, top Mazda salesperson for the state of North Carolina. Old state. Year two, top salesperson for Mazda East Coast. That's the whole East Coast. Top salesperson. 
but I'm not faking. I'm grinding every day as a grind for me. Now I got five kids and one on the way. Five big kids and now a little one on top of that. So I'm not playing. Year three, we're getting on close to the, where, where we at now. Year three, top black salesperson in the United States for my no other black salesperson in the state sold more new cars than I did in year three. The owner of the dealership, Mr. <coughs> Shepherd, that I worked for, I said, you know what, let me talk to you for a minute. We was having a big company meeting at one of these, the lake, ice resort or something, Lake Norman. At the end, I said, Mr. Kepa, I need to talk to him. He knows me well now. I'm selling a lot of cars for me, making them money. I need to talk to him. I need to have a meeting with him. He got his phone. Okay, well, let's do such and such date. I went in his office, sat down, had a meeting. I told him, just in case you don't know, let me give you some insight on who I am, where I came from, how I came to work for the company, and where I'm at now. Because I do see myself growing. And I don't want nobody to come back to you once I'm already doing good and in a management position, thinking they're telling you something about me that you don't know. So let me tell you now. And man, we sat there talking, and he cried a real tear by the time he got finished with him, telling them the real deal. And he told me at that time, no matter what nobody says, we're going to have a job here. This is the owner. He owns all of the dealership, a lot of them. Even with that, grew within that company, became a um, top salesperson, so many different uh, awards, have one here, elite master certified, that means you cannot get no higher certification on the, the, the vehicles and the process. The next person who knew more than me about these cars is the ones who built them from scratch. Other than that, when you reach this level, you know everything about the car, every, everything about the car. Uh, grew from there into business manager, which means this is you're the finance manager, you handle all, all of the bank paperwork and all of the finance and all of the credit. This is what you do. By the time the customer gets to me, they've already agreed to buy the car. Now we're going to do the paperwork. And Got to present to them the options to purchase extended coverage, things like gap insurance, different coverages. You're in your own office. You got to take so many different co compliance classes. Flew me to Houston, Texas to take a class for a week. They put you in a five star hotel, car service, food, money to spend. Achieve that within the company. Now, once again, taking it to another level, I have the keys to the dealership. I got a key to open up the dealership. I have access. I drive whatever, whatever car is out there that I want to drive, I drive. Mazda, the manufacturer in Japan, said, for your achievements, this is your car to drive. Three years, when you finish driving this one, then you can get you another one to drive. But we want you to always drive out the, the new cars that come out. And with that, we want to pay you $150 for each new car that you sell forever. On top of whatever your commission already is. So to give y'all an idea of the potential and the money that you can make in this business. In my first year, I think I made like 52000 In my second year, I made about seventy-eight. In my third year, I made about eighty-five. And for the last two years, I'm always going to make over 100000 a year, but as long as I stay in the business. You, I won't even now, the same person who was so happy to get a job for minimum wage, I won't even go to work in the dealership for I won't work for less than 80,000 a year. I won't, I won't do it. 
And they won't even offer me that. So here we go, taking it to another level once again. The recruitment department from Hendrick Automotive. We have surely have seen a Hendrick dealership somewhere, commercial somewhere. They have about 120 dealerships across the country. Their recruitment department sought me out, contacted me, wanted me to come in and just talk with them. I did. They said, oh, Mr. Robinson, we've been following your progress. We would like to offer you a position within BMW. This is a position that BMW have created. What you will be doing is you will be a retail business manager, and your job description is you will be able to take the customer from the beginning to the end. You do the fine, you're selling the car, do the financing. We're going to assign to you a product, product genius. This is your assistant. They know everything about the cars. They're going to explain everything about the car to the customer. They're going to do the test drive and the delivery, and you're just going to take care of the paperwork and do what you do with the customer. We have already Googled you and went online and read all of your reviews, and we would love to have you on the team. This is what we're going to offer you. We're going to give you a salary, $75,000 a year. This is the salary. You don't know, want nothing back. This is going to $6,300 or something dollar a month. This is guaranteed, plus commission. And is there anything else that we can do for you to sweeten up the day? Yeah, just let me get a new BMW to drive <laughs> because, uh, you know, I like to know the product that I'm selling. I want to fill the car with a lot of I said, so long as I can have a new BMW every three months, then we got the deal. They didn't even have to think about it. Oh, sure, we got a deal. When can you start? When you send you the paperwork, take your drugs back. When can you, when can you start? Now, mind you, because I'm telling you, you got to continue to take it to another level. It's not no sense to get it satisfied. I'm already with a dealership. I got the keys to the owner is my man. Like, we cool. And I can drive whatever car I want to. I can tell somebody to come on. I can get her a car to drive. Yeah, put the tag on. Let me get a copy of your license. I'll see you Friday. I can give her a car to drive. Everybody in my family almost got a Mazda now. I got five kids that's driving every last one of them got a new car. Cousins, aunt, everybody got a, a, a new car, another car. So I was already comfortable where I was at. We kept it with Mazda and doing well, highly recognized within the manufacturer. They called me from Japan. They want to call me and ask me, what do I think they should do to the car? What type of feedback am I getting from the customer? This they called from Japan with a translator. They wanted to know before they built this last car. The manufacturer. I walk away from that. See, I'm already there, but I'm comfortable. I could have just stayed there, I would make 110, 120,000 a year and just be comfortable. I walk away for that for, for another opportunity with Hendrick BMW, continuing to take it to another level. I promise you. And I know because for the youngsters that's out there, the I am the OG. They ain't gonna deny it, can't deny it. I know that I'm making more money than they making in the street. That I don't have to invest nothing. In the street drug money is a wholesale retail business. We have to buy the product with your money, you have to purchase it. Then you have to resell it. So you gotta make your money back that you spent, then make a profit from it. I don't have to worry about that. He says, oh, my cause, I, don't, I ain't paying nothing for them. I just got to sell them. So I know that I'm making way more money than them dudes in the street. Then you have to be a heavy hitter to make $10,000, $12,000 a month in clear money. But one thing that you're not going to have is a clear mind and a clear conscience because you're always going to be worried about them boys coming. And they are coming. They can get you real quick. They got them bad. <laughs> they was a terrorist. But you ain't even got to go that far. They got Big Reach, and Big Reach was getting money. 
too. When they got him, he's in the joint. I paddled my way out. When I was getting out, Mitch was coming and I passed him in the land. Dude, I'm out, baby. You got 30 years. You got 30 years. So I know that it's a possibility for you where you're sitting at, depending on you, that you can get the kind of money that you think that you can only get from doing something illegal to do. I know that for a fact, but one thing for sure, like, trust me, these shoes, they're not a gift. You go in the stores, run the car, and I'm like, hey, mm -mm, they, the manufacturer paid for this with my gift rewards card, because you get points and stuff for doing this and doing that. I save up on points, and then when I want to spend $250 on a pair of shoes, I let them pay for it. The company. And I do that. Quite a few because I like shoes you know so i got probably i don't know 40 some pair of jordans probably i don't know 18 or 19 pair of foam posits and i ain't sold not one piece of crack to get it and i ain't robbed nobody to get it and i ain't committed no crime to of whatsoever to do and that is what is possible one thing about this um country before i wrap up there is a lot of turmoil, turmoil going on right now in the country. A lot of talk and a lot of rhetoric. Don't feed into it. One thing for sure, that this is a fact and I am a living witness, this is still the only country in the world that you can come from where I came from and from where you sitting from right now and still be whatever that you want to be if you persist. Stay determined and don't give up on yourself and you will have some people that will give up on you and you will have some people that will step up for you and i cannot sit here and pretend like i did it all on my own because i did i had some family support i had people continuing to uh, pray for me and i have had people black and white alike risk for me who have donated some of their time and energy for me I have had that um, the next but well, I, I got to get this get this in and then I'll wrap up that segment what I just talked about is a skill set so learn how to do something you know, as you grow learn how to do something that you can always if all else you can do that but that's going to be up to you to take it serious because you're going to have opportunities to do it through detention centers, through school, through people that you know who's already in the field. And there's people in the community that is willing to, to help you. Because um, like I, I should, I'm supposed to be at work now. I took all this day to come in. They didn't pay me to come here. I took off this day to volunteer to come in and kick and share my story with you in hopes that one day in the future you will be able to you know, know that there's another option for you. That you won't have no fear walking into a car dealership or any business and asking for a job. Knowing that it's possible to get it because you've already heard from somebody who did do it before. You see what I'm saying? That is the reality. That is why I'm here to be a witness to you that it is possible for you to, to do uh, great things and be successful. Now, real quick, one other thing that I wanted to be able to point out to you, because in all of my classes and courses, in and out of school, and groups joining, everybody I talked to, one very important thing was left out. Uh, and I want to share that with y'all real quick. You think about it, research it, and uh, gather some information on your own about it. And that is finances and credit. One advantage that you do have is that you ain't got old enough to establish nothing. But remember that I did tell you this. Your credit is going to be one of the most important tools at your disposal from here on until you hit the graveyard. 
protect it. Learn everything that you can learn about it. And just knowing that can position you to be more successful in life. Just knowing what credit is, knowing what your credit score is, how important it is, being able to budget and maintain your finances. That alone could keep you out of these type of places. Because when you get good credit, and everybody starts at the same place, none. When you get good credit, you have the ability to get what you want with your signature. It's not nothing that my mind can think of that I want and I can't sign for no money down. To, on the phone, when I get in the car, I ain't got no to the place. I need to do it on the phone, whatever I want. Order a car, a house, or whatever on the phone. And that is from credit. So protect that, learn everything you can about that. Remember that if you don't remember nothing else from what I talked about. No credit is very important. Your attitude is going to determine where you go at and what you do in life. A poor attitude, you ain't going for. A bad attitude, somebody probably going to kill you. Or you're going to have to kill somebody. And you know what the end result of that is. So. Now, one more pitch and then question and answer. This is from um, finance school when I was there. Kim. Were you the only minority? Yes. No, I was another brother there, and then uh, like an Indian guy. And this girl right here, she was Hispanic. Um, but across the country, in these dealerships, I mean, this once you get to a certain management position, then it, Starts getting fewer and fewer of us, but you can, you know, if, we, if there are minority-owned dealerships across the country. So this group, and I talked to them all while I was there. This group, none of them had been through what I had been through in my life. Everybody had their own different trials and tribulations throughout life. None of them had been through where I, what I had been through. But yet we were still all at the same place at the same time. How long have you been at Hendrix? I've been there since uh You went at the fair, right? I went after the fair. Because I you months. know all my stuff say kept for my eyes and you could have told me. Yeah. You no. <laughs> so now I have been there about two months. So all right. Hendrix, when I was here, I was here still with uh, Kevin Boston. But I mean, I didn't see this last picture. This is from Can I get a job? Can I get a job? From the clip, is it a joke? So now we are ready for question and answer because y'all just it look like stay out a little, little longer. No, they got about 15, 10 minutes. All right, so they, they asked you what's the ATF? Huh? What's the ATF? Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Just like the FBI, but that's what they do. They handle alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. So any type of like um, gun cases, the ATF normally has that case. Um, tobacco because it has to be taxed individually for each state. So like in North Carolina, they produce cigarettes here. So a pack of Newports here is like five dollars and fifty cents. They're fifteen dollars in New York. So people would buy cigarettes here and then take them. And that's the reason. Can you explain the difference between the federal charge and the, the state charge? Because when you said that the federal government was coming after you, how they're saying that we want to try you immediately as opposed to the states trying you where the federal government doesn't run out of money. Right. Um, there's jurisdiction. So the state have a jurisdiction, the federal government has the ultimate jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. They can choose to indict a state charge. You can have a state charge, like my charges started out in the state, and the feds came and picked um, picked up the case. And their their resources is un unlimited, so for them to get you to a speedy trial is nothing. In the state, it can take some time 
a lot of cases end up getting um, dismissed because they've exceeded the, the time limit. But the guidelines in the federal system is much harsher than in the state system. So either way, you don't want to go to neither one of them. Any more questions on this? What charges? That's it. What charges on my federal charge? Conspiracy to distribute uh, cocaine, conspiracy to distribute crack cocaine, and conspiracy to commit armed robbery. And conspiracy mean like you was working with in concert with three or four people. And in a conspiracy, you didn't have to like get caught with nothing. You didn't sell nothing to an undercover, but he did, and he was from my block and my crew. And, you know, I, we might have dealt, dealt together at some point, and now we all was a team of crew. So you said the president waived you for a or something? Or no. Uh, my homeboy who I used to get money with in the street, Cadillac, was doing a life sentence. And Obama, President Obama, pardoned a lot of people, and some crack laws changed. And so his life sentence got reduced down to 30 years. Had it not been for Obama, a lot of people would still be in there doing life. That's already been in there uh, 20 years. Almost forgot. This right here. This right here. That is in the plane, probably needs it in the federal one. This is a letter that um, when President Obama was in office that he sent to me. I wrote him a letter you know, thanking him for his, you know, the things that he done for me and for the inspiration that he was to me when I was sitting in prison, watching him being elected on TV. And I wrote him and told him about my experiences, the same things like I just kind of told y'all, but more briefly. And he wrote me back. And this is what he had to say. From the White House stamp, Dear Kenny, thank you for writing. I was moved by your story, and I want you to know I admire all the work you have put into forging a bright future for yourself and your family. I believe that all people have the capacity to make good choices and contribute to society in meaningful ways. And it's clear that it's clear that's important to you too. My administration is working to support those who have paid their debt, their debt to society and are looking to rebuild their lives. And I am struck by your desire to participate in our democracy and ensure your children know no limits to what they can achieve. Again, thank you for writing and for your kind words of support. As a father, I can tell how proud you are of your mm -hmm. girls, and I hope you'll let them know how much I believe mm -hmm. in them. I wish you and your family all of the best. Sincerely, Barack Obama, that of that. Sent to him. And based on um, the content of his response, I mean, he had to read it because what I told him inside of the letter that he replied back to for certain things. Do any of y'all that say he has any questions? Any kind of question from anywhere? Thank you. Do anybody in here? Now, after hearing this, believe that you can pretty much achieve whatever you want to achieve, regardless of the circumstances. That you know, this time period in your life will be the past. Yeah. You know, uh, everybody that you meet, like everybody that I meet, they don't get to hear this. I don't have to tell every. That's over with. You know what I mean? And I don't want to be judged by that, but it's still part of my uh, story. So I don't mind telling it, but everybody that I meet don't get to hear it, you know. So as you progress and, you know, change your life, do bigger and better things, everybody don't have to know about the few little mistakes that you may have um, made in life. You know? And do know and believe that, that you have some support. Community. They are waiting. I'm involved in some, some different type of programs. They're waiting for me to get it back and you know give them an update on what has been done and what might be needed in order to uh, say once you guys get out or that can help while you're here. 
He wants to do anything that comes to the community. But uh, he wants to know, is there anything in the community that y'all need? I think of one thing that Think of one thing that one of the things that kids all talked about was having jobs and have the opportunity to make money as opposed to illegal money. Can you talk about that? Yes. So <clears throat> when you never made no money before, you don't have really an idea of what is money. You just know what what you want, what it costs, and know that you're gonna have to get some money in order to get that. But you really don't have an idea of what money is. Now uh, the average, in order it just making twelve, thirteen dollars an hour is about twenty-four thousand dollars a year. That's that's not a lot, but a lot of people are forced to try to make it work off of that. When it comes to making a large income. It's really how far you set your goals. What do you want to do? What do you want to make? Cognitive but there is a to make way more money uh, legally than it is illegally. That's a fact. So, like a guaranteed job where you can guarantee have some control over your own income and what you want to make, still to this day, it still sells. So if you want to have potential for unlimited income, sell something or create something that can be sold. And the potential is what whatever you want it to be. So not only like I'm in the car business, but uh, my wife and I have a hair salon in Charlotte on South Boulevard too. She's a, one of the top style, hairstylists in, in the city. And even though she even could make 80, 90, 100,000 a year, I just did some restructuring with her that's going to help her probably make an extra 20 or 30,000 just from selling products. She just do the service, but now we pitch selling the actual product. So, yes, uh, sales of any nature, you can have you know, unlimited potential and learn a lot and make way more money than probably whoever you know that you think is getting money. Did your limited amount of education help you to become who you are now? I know that you said you read a lot, and you were you understood what you read. Yes. Now, education-wise, I did go and get my GED, so I knew how important it was to at least have a GED. I did it, and then I went from there, and I did go to college. But throughout my life, uh, if I could, educational-wise, my biggest advantage was. Uh, reading the mathematics, and I've been able to use that throughout. So uh, a lot of the testing and things that you have to do in my career, it takes a lot of reading and watching, you know, videos. But you have to understand what you're reading. But just being able to read is one thing, but to comprehend and understand what you're reading, that is another. So if you have a problem understanding what you read, you gotta like really reach out for some help immediately because to just to read and not know what you read is nothing. And uh, mathematics, in its simplest form, addition, multiplication, um, division. If you can master that, then I mean, you got a, a shot. So reading the mathematics was my biggest advantage, uh, education-wise. Any other questions about education? Has anybody, has nobody in has graduated yet? Oh, yeah. oh no, we don't have any graduates. We have four graduates on campus. Three so. GD grads and one high school grad. Uh, now, from from you guys, and any one of y'all can answer this question, uh, what would y'all like to have available to the facility that's not available now? What could it be more of? Computers, uh, books, books. Yeah. 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 
think about the people that come after you. Yeah. What would you have liked to see that you could have done? A, maybe an auto mechanics class, maybe yeah, all types of stuff. Computer class, like you used to have. Art class. Yeah. Art class, computer class, mm -hmm. or maybe uh, what about like uh, if somebody could show you a process to a sales process? Because there's a process and everything. People, they don't just come to me and just want that car. We want to sign right there for it. They don't work that way. Yeah. There's a process of how you have to, to do it. Um, that process is taught. It can be taught. And it's like one of those things, once you learn how to do it, you'll never forget that. Uh, so like more career readiness classes. Uh, more formative books like on different subjects and just like break the story for you. These books look a little dated. These books look a little dated. Now, um, only thing that I didn't touch up, touch on, and then I'm um, I'm ready to conclude if there's not any more questions. Is uh, the importance of uh, staying away from drugs and alcohol. I didn't really touch on it because I didn't have that issue, but I do know some who did. My brother, my parents, people that I grew up with. That's one battle that I didn't have to fight. I never became addicted to, to drugs. I never became addicted to cocaine or no type of narcotic and never was an alcoholic. So I can't say like where I would have been had I went through that struggle because I did. But I do know I probably wouldn't have been here right now if I had that to deal with. Very important, stay away. Just don't do it. Uh, cocaine, heroin, opioids, pills, lean. That is a sure way for destruction. It is very hard to kick it, break it. The government right now is trying to find a way to, to combat it. I left out the part that they invited me to come over to uh, Fox News, the national news channel. They contacted me. They, uh, me and another guy that I was locked up with, he was a former U.S. attorney, like one of the attorneys that got me locked up. He was one of them. He worked for the federal government. He hurt his back, became addicted to um, painkillers, and ended up on heroin, robbed like three banks, and was in prison with me. So he and I, you know, both got out. He's out, wrote a book, and working for an addiction campus of America, doing well for himself right now. Uh, <clears throat> He and I went to Fox News. They invited us to come there and do a segment of Addicted, uh, Addicted in America. They flew me on up there first class and put me in a five-star hotel. And then next morning, we went and did the news um, segment on drug abuse in America, the opioid problem, the addiction problem. Uh, it is a lot different from what I went through. Crack epidemic took a lot of lives, but the actual drug itself, nobody like never OD from crack. It couldn't like you want to OD and die. You could OD and die from shooting cocaine or for sniffing too much cocaine, but nobody's died from smoking too much cocaine. But what you guys is up against now, the way they mix in and the way they cut in these drugs, it is completely unsafe and it's killing people. Uh, every three weeks, new study came out every three weeks the same amount of people that died on 9 11 when the planes hit the building over 3,000 and some people every three weeks the same amount of people die from drug overdoses from every age from 12 to 80. that is the one of the biggest problems that when you get out it's a lot of temptations a lot of you know people your age are trying your first try could be your last try i'm serious there's a lot of overdose going on. So much so that the government, once again, they reaching out to guys like me. They want to know, what can we do? Is it any, got any type of ideas? I need to the budget. Oh, well, you can say that. But at the end of the day, you will be the one to make the decision to use it, however it got here. So make that decision not to use it and make that decision not to be a part of it, regardless of, of how it got here. See what I'm saying? So look for yourself on an individual level, the choices that I'm going to make myself. 
and not the outside sources of all these different factors that's working against you. You have to, to do that, and they just they can say whatever you want to say. They want to say the people that you around. Because some dudes that I grew up with, a lot of them is dead. Some of them still locked up. Some of them still flipping and flopping around out there on the street. And some of them are, you know, doing like I'm doing, and they're trying to make a difference. Anything else whatsoever. I hope that um, what I offer y'all have been useful. Take some of it and uh, 